Welcome educators to another informational video here to help you pass your RECA test on your next try. This video is being brought to you by RECATest.com, the official test prep site for the RECA test. In today's video, I'm going to walk you problem by problem through our online free practice test for subtest number one. That being said, if you haven't taken the practice test yourself yet, I highly recommend using the link in the description below to take the test yourself and then come back to rewatch the explanation of the answers. In order to get to the practice test, all you have to do is go to RikaTest.com. Scroll down past our bundle offer through our online course and study guide, keep going past the individual study guides, and right here you'll see Rika practice tests. Now these are free online and computer scored practice tests and they're here to help you prepare for the test day. This video is all about subtest one, so all you have to do is click this button. Next, enter your email address. And let's begin. Number one says, a kindergarten teacher plays the following game with students. The teacher says, guess whose name I'm going to say now. The teacher then says the initial sound of a student's name, for example, mmm, for Mariko and the children try to guess the name. This activity is likely to promote the reading development of students primarily by helping them. All right, first one, blend separate sounds and words. Mm, doesn't sound like that's happening. Recognize that a spoken word is made up of sounds. Okay, understand the principles of phonics. Lastly, learn how to spell their own names. Well, they're not doing any spelling. For this, this is recognizing a spoken word is made up of sounds. Beginning here, the teacher is focusing on initial sounds, like mmm for Mariko. Number two, which of the following informal assessments would be most appropriate to use to assess an individual student's phonemic awareness? First one, asking the student to identify the sound at the beginning, middle, or end of a spoken word. For example, what sound do you hear at the end of steep? Second one, having the student listen to a tape-recorded story while looking at the book and then answer several simple questions about the story. Next, asking the student to identify the letters in the alphabet that correspond to the initial consonant sounds of several familiar spoken words. And lastly, having the student listen to the teacher read aloud a set of words with the same beginning sound. For example, train, trap, trouble, and then repeat the words. Remember that phonemic awareness is all about the sound. So first of all, letter C or the third one, you can take that right out because the student doesn't need to identify the letters. Remember that phonemic awareness is the ability to distinguish the separate phonemes or sounds in a spoken word. And we do this as teachers through using initial, middle, and end sounds of a word. Because of that, I know the first answer is the best. Number three. A kindergarten teacher is preparing a student for a phonemic awareness assessment. Teacher says, what is this a picture of? The teacher displays a picture of a boat. The student says, a boat? The teacher then says, a boat, that's right. Now let's say the word boat together very slowly. Ba -o -t. The student pronounces the word with the teacher. The teacher says, how many sounds do you hear? Ba -o -t. The teacher slowly repeats the word. The student says, three? The teacher says, that's right. Three. Now, I'd like you to do the same for more words. This assessment would be an appropriate way to test the student's ability to perform which of the following phonemic awareness tasks. Is it? The first one, counting and blending the phonemes in a word. Next, identifying onsets and rhymes. Next, recognizing how many phonemes are contained in a word. Or lastly, relating phonemes to a letter. The first thing that jumped out to me is that I know it's not identifying onsets and rhymes because here the teacher is segmenting all of the sounds and then asking how many sounds there are. Whereas an onset and a rhyme is the onset is the initial consonant and the rhyme is the part after that. So for example, in the word pan, P-A-N, the onset is P and the rhyme is A-N. I know that the last option is out because we're not relating the phonemes to letters. So that really leaves us with A and C, or the first and the third. However, I can eliminate the first because although the student is asked to count, the student is not asked to blend. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The student is segmenting the word into sounds. So the best choice is the third, recognizing how many phonemes are contained in a word. Number four, the use of rhyming texts for kindergarten read-alouds is likely to promote the reading development of kindergarten students primarily by first, fostering their phonological awareness, increasing their vocabulary knowledge, 
enhancing their understanding of story elements, or improving their letter recognition skills. So first, I'm eliminating the second answer, increasing vocabulary knowledge, because although read-alouds definitely increase vocabulary knowledge, it's not the use of rhyming text in particular that increase vocabulary knowledge. Secondly, I'm going to take out or eliminate the third option of story elements, because in order to teach story elements, a teacher needs to directly and explicitly teach that skill. However, here we're using rhyming text as a read-aloud, so story elements simply isn't in this lesson. And then lastly, I'm going to eliminate improving letter recognition skills, or the final option, and that's because students are rhyming. So rhyming words have to do with the sound, whereas here, letter recognition skills has to do with the letters themselves. So I'm going to say the first one, fostering their phonological awareness. Number five, which of the following strategies would best help a kindergarten student who is having difficulty visually distinguishing between the letters B and D? Is it number one, helping the student focus on the directionality of each letter as the student traces it? Two, having the student look for the letters within the text of a favorite picture book. Three, repeating the name of each letter several times as the student points to the letter. Or finally, the last one, encouraging the student to observe closely as the teacher writes the letters. Okay, I'm eliminating the second option here first, because if a student is having difficulty distinguishing letters P and D, for example, which is really common for students to do, what you don't want to do is use a picture book, because what you do want to do is focus on the letters. Although repeating the name of each letter several times as a student points to the letter might build letter recognition skills, I don't think this is going to be the best solution. Encouraging the student to observe closely, again, isn't going to harm the student, and in fact it will probably help However, the student needs to do more of an active way of learning. So I'm going to go back up to the first one, helping the student focus on the directionality of each letter as the student traces it. And see, that's the difference between the first and the last, is the, the last option is more of a passive way of learning, whereas the first option is more active. So I'm going to go here with the first one. Number six, a first grader can identify the letters of the alphabet and decode a number of simple words. He becomes confused, however, when tracking print in consecutive lines of print, which of the following strategies is likely to be most effective in helping the student read a short paragraph of simple text? Is it the first one? Help him sound out unfamiliar words included in the text before he attempts to read the entire paragraph. Second, have him use his finger or marker as he reads the text. Third, help him increase his reading rate to improve his understanding of the continuity between words and sentences in the paragraph. Or lastly, modify the paragraph by using a yellow highlighter to identify natural groupings of words and phrases within the paragraph. Young learners will often get confused or skip lines when they begin reading paragraphs. In order to combat this, Teach children to use their finger or a marker or a ruler or something that they can put on the text to stay on the right line. The answer here is the second one. Number seven, which of the following instructional practices would be most effective in promoting kindergarten students' understanding of the alphabetic principle? Is it number one, routinely saying the sounds in words when writing the words on the board? Second, creating a writing center in the classroom stocked with paper and writing implements. Third, labeling key objectives in the classroom such as the clock and tables. Or lastly, stopping frequently during read-alouds to carefully pronounce and define important words. Okay, I'm eliminating the last option because where we don't have to define important words here in order to understand the alphabetic principle. In order to answer this question, remember that the alphabetic principle, and simply put, is just that letters represent sounds. So here, the first option, routinely saying the sounds in words when writing the words on the board, is going to be your best solution. Number eight, an emergent reader frequently reverses some letters and numbers during writing tasks. Which of the following strategies would be most effective in helping the student develop more accurate letter formation skills? So the first thing that comes to mind before I even read the options below is that accurate letter formation skills means legible writing. So let's see what our options are. First one, providing the student with supplemental practice writing lists of words that are spelled with the target letters. Second, having the student practice tracing the target letter shapes with a finger 
while saying aloud the sequence of steps to form each letter, providing the student with a supplemental handwriting workbook that describes the formation of the target letters in a series of steps, or lastly, encouraging the student to vocalize words when writing, especially when the words contain the target letters. I'm going to go back up to the beginning of the question because that keyword emergent reader is very important. Remember that in the reading progress there are different stages to reading development and for an emergent reader they may often mix letters up or here as it says reverse some letters and numbers during writing. The best solution would be the second one, which is having the student practice tracing the target letter shapes with a finger while saying aloud the sequence of steps to form each letter. And that's because this practice is both kinesthetic as well as auditory. Number nine, in the word chimpanzee, which of the following pairs of letters is a digraph? So to answer this, you have to know what a digraph is. The two most commonly confused keywords are digraph and blend. And it's quite easy to remember because the word blend has a blend in it, which is B and L. So if you say bull, you hear the B and you hear the L. Whereas if you take the word, for example, elephant, elephant, the PH, actually digraph also has a digraph in it, which is PH. So the difference between a blend and a digraph is that a blend has two letters that make two sounds, bull, whereas digraph is, has two letters that make one sound. The PH is f, like elephant, or digraph. So think about the word chimpanzee and ask yourself, which two letters make one sound? Is it the CH, ch, or the MP, mp, or the AN, an, or the E, like E? Although the last option is, I personally don't think that they needed to add the EE -E in there because it can be a little confusing, but it's not, but EE -E isn't a digraph. However, CH is. Number 10, a kindergarten student has demonstrated the ability to write words phonetically, but she is reluctant to write because she is worried about misspelling words. The teacher could best promote the student's reading and writing development by number one, reassuring her that it is okay for now to express herself in writing by spelling words as they sound, two, giving her a spelling list of high frequency sight words to copy and learn each day, three, helping her make a list of words that she already knows how to spell correctly, or four, suggesting that she spend time copying some of the words found in her favorite stories. Okay, so definitely. The second and the fourth are just out. A kindergarten student doesn't really need to practice in that manner. At that age, what you want to do is teach a love of reading and with that an enjoyment of writing. Definitely the best answer is simply to reassure her that it's okay, that she can spell the way that she's spelling, just do her best job and really just enjoy it. We're going with the first one. Number 11. During which of the following stages of spelling development do students typically begin to show an understanding of the correspondence between letters and sounds? Now, this is a pretty good question because you really should know the different stages of phonics development, which there are actually five, although four are listed here. And the five are pre-communicative, semi-phonetic, phonetic, transitional, and lastly, conventional. If you don't know or can't remember, these are the types of keywords that will sort of make or break your multiple choice section on your test. You really need to know a lot of keywords for the RECA test. And again, if you haven't already signed up, take our online course and definitely get our study guide. For this question, I know that the best answer is semi-phonetic. And that's because children in the semi-phonetic stage of spelling development attempt to use letters to represent sounds. And that's exactly what's happening here. We can tell because the problem says that the student is just beginning to have an understanding of correspondence between letters and sounds. So that means that the student has passed the pre-communicative, which in that case is when students don't write letters at all, but simply make squiggles and pictures to represent what they're thinking or feeling. However, on the stage after semi-phonetic, which is phonetic, a student's writing is actually pretty decent. A sentence written like, I like to play soccer, you'll be able to read what it means or says, even though there will be, you know, like soccer might be spelled wrong with like one C or a K or something like that. So for this answer, 
it's semi-phonetic. Number 12, function words such as to, the, and of are most appropriately taught in the context of which of the following areas of reading instruction. This one should be kind of like, I haven't even read the answers below, but if you see words like to, the, and of, you just know that those are sight words. So let's go see if there's a sight word solution down below. Phonics, skills, practice, not really. Structural analysis, no, it's not the structure of the words. Academic language development, no. Sight, okay, there we go, sight words vocabulary. That's just the answer. There we go. Number 13. A first grade teacher provides students with explicit systematic phonics instruction to promote their reading development, okay? When designing activities to teach letter sound correspondences, the teacher should, all right, number one, provide reading opportunities for students to practice sounds in context after studying the sounds in isolation, two, make certain that students have mastered vowel sounds before focusing on consonants, ensure that students master the spelling of practice words using the target sound before teaching a new sound, or lastly, include instruction in related consonant blends when introducing individual consonants. Okay, so I'm looking at the first option and I'm going to jump right to that. Provide reading opportunities for students to practice sounds in context after studying words in isolation. Number 14. Early in the school year, a first grade teacher wants to conduct an assessment of students' ability to read grade appropriate words, including phonetically regular words and high frequency irregular sight words, which of the following informal assessments would be most appropriate and effective for this purpose? Number one, the teacher pairs each student with a partner for shared oral reading of simple texts and makes anecdotal notes on their performance. I'm going to guess already that that's not going to be it because if I was assessing a student, I wouldn't have the student paired with another student particularly at the beginning of the year. I just want to focus on that student for the time being. But let's go ahead and see what the other options say. The teacher meets individually, good, with students and asks each student to write a list of words the student knows how to read. All right, that's just definitely not the answer because we're testing reading and here the first thing the student is doing is writing. So that can't be it. Number three, the teacher allows each student to select a grade appropriate text from the classroom library and asks each student to try reading the text aloud. Remember that this is a first grade student and first grade teacher. Especially in first grade, the teacher needs to prepare the assessments. You can't have a student just go ahead and pick a book because you want to assess on a certain level. So let's go ahead and read the fourth option. The teacher prepares, good, a list of grade appropriate words, good, and asks each student to try reading the words aloud and records the results. Okay, that's definitely the correct answer. Number 15, several first graders have mastered sounding out and blending words that follow simple short vowel phonics patterns. Their teacher would like to help them begin to develop whole word reading, for example, automatic word recognition of words that follow these patterns. Which of the following instructional approaches would be most effective for this purpose? Is it the first one, using student read-alouds followed by echo reading, then choral rereading of the student's favorite texts that include some simple words? Mm, not sure about that. Scheduling frequent silent independent reading practice of word lists based on the student's oral language vocabulary. I don't really see a connection between the student's oral language vocabulary and the silent independent reading in order to help the student develop whole word recognition or automaticity. So let's keep going on to the third option. Providing modeling, okay, that sounds good, and guide students practice sounding out simple regular, wor simple, regular words sub-vocally and then reading them aloud normally. Okay, that sounds pretty good. But let's go have a look at the last one. Exposing students to common environmental print to provide frequent exposures to everyday words and phrases. I'm definitely going with the third option. That just provides the type of instruction in order to help students build their reading automaticity. Number 16. When reading aloud texts, a second grade English learner often makes errors in pronunciation that are unrelated to her ability to accurately decode the words. The teacher's best response would be to 1. Write down words the student mispronounces and include them on a list for her to practice reading aloud. Hmm, if a teacher did this, I could see how their intentions would be right, 
but this would be the wrong instructional strategy to do because it says in the question that the student's error isn't related to her ability to decode words. And here, what the teacher is doing is making a list of words. So I'm sure that the student would be able to read the list of words, but she's just having a difficult time when the words are in context or in like a text or a paragraph. But let's go check out the other options. Number two, analyze the student's pronunciation patterns and plan an intervention to address difficulties that may affect her reading comprehension. That sounds a lot better, but let's keep going. Encourage other students in the class to help. I can already tell you, no, it's the teacher's job to teach, and although you can assign reading pair groups to help each other out, really, I know that the RECA test is not ever going to present you with a problem that the solution is that other peers help the student in, in in their reading journey. But okay, let's just, let's finish that third one. I'm curious of what it says. Encourage other students in the class to help the student work on improving her accuracy and pronunciation. No. D, help the student avoid having pronunciation errors. Count as reading miscues by stopping her and having her correct her own errors. Also not right, because for every time that you stop a student when they make an error when they're reading, it can frustrate the reader and bog them down and just Again, what we want to be doing as teachers is growing that love of reading, and if you keep stopping a student and saying, you made an error, you made an error, fix it, th that love of reading is going to sort of pop or burst or just deflate, really. So I'm going back up to the second answer, analyze the student's pronunciation patterns. I mean, that just sounds smart, right? Like for a teacher to do. And then plan, again, so analyze, plan these keywords, take out these keywords, and it looks good an intervention to address the difficulties, right? So you can talk with the reading specialist, parents, other teachers, the principal, and yeah, make a plan. That sounds really good. Number 16 is the second option. Let's keep going. Number 17, which of the following approaches would be most effective in helping first grade students who have the prerequisite decoding skills learn to decode words that end in the inflectional morpheme ing? The first option states explicitly teaching the students to read the unit ing or ing in isolation before teaching them to decode familiar words that end in the inflection. That could be really useful. All right. Um, for example, if you, for example, if you show the word play to a student and then you have another maybe picture with the ing and you put them together and they read playing, then that seems like it would really help. Especially if you teach the ing in isolation and they already know play and then you put it together and they can say play and that sounds good but let's keep going and see what the other options say using think alouds during a guided reading to model how to use contextual analysis as a strategy for recognizing words ending in ing you know what there are a lot of really good words in this solution like using think alouds and guided reading and the word model and contextual analysis and strategy recognizing it all sounds good i just don't think it's the solution for this problem let's go on to the third one having students practice reading word lists that include words ending in both the more familiar rhyme ing as well as the inflection ing what you really want to do is teach the skill not teach specific words so the last option says teaching the inflectional ending ing in the context of an instructional unit on identifying open and closed syllables in multisyllabic words I still think that the first option is by far the best so that's what I'm going with number 18 an 8th grade teacher wants to help students improve their spelling of scientific vocabulary, including the terms listed below. Barometer, centimeter, dehydrate, hydrogen, <laughs> hydrogen, microscope, telescope, thermal, thermometer. Which of the following instructional strategies is likely to be the most effective for this purpose? All right, before I even look at the solution, the first thing that I'm thinking of helping students with these types of words is either going to be using like a word web um, with root words or possibly because these are all scientific words and they will have like Greek or Latin roots and affixes and prefixes, I would do something like that. But let's see what the solutions say. First one, showing students how to divide scientific terms into syllables and facilitate accurate spelling. Don't think so. Second, conducting practice drills to help student memorize. Okay, if anything about like memorizing, I'm, I don't think that's ever going to be a uh, sound solution, but let's see what they say. Conducting practice drills to help students memorize the irregular spelling patterns of the words. You really want the students to grow a, like, you really want the students to wonder why things are the way they are, and so just having students 
memorize words isn't much of a learning skill. I would not say B is it at all. All right, let's go check out the third solution. Familiarizing students with the spelling and meaning of Greek morphemes. There we go. Greek morphemes in scientific terms. I'm guessing that's the answer. Lots of words, spe specifically in the scientific realm, come from our Greek background. And that is both interesting to students as well as informational. So, okay, but let's see what the last one says. Helping students determine correct spellings by dividing the words into onsets and rhymes. These types of words, microscope, telescope, are not the ones that you divide up into onsets and rhymes. They really, you divide them up by root words, and here the Greek morphemes is the way to go. So we're going with the third one, perhaps letter C if you want to call it like that. All right, and then number 19. A sixth grade teacher observes that several students have misspelled the word pasteurize. After writing pasteurize and Louis Pasteur on the board, the teacher explains how Pasteur, Pasteur, if I'm pronouncing that right, invented the process of pasteurization. Students then discuss how the word Pasteur relates to the word pasteurize. This instructional activity fosters students' reading and writing development primarily by a, helping them learn to use etymology to improve spelling and decoding of multisyllabic words. I'm guessing that that's it, but let's keep going. Helping them improve their ability to distinguish between similarly spelled words, motivating them to use orthographic patterns to expand their vocabulary knowledge, and motivating them to improve their spelling and decoding through the use of systematic study skills. In order to understand that A is the right answer, you'd have to know what etymology is. And remember that etymology is like how the word came to be, like what's the history of the word. And that's exactly what the teacher did, is just told the students the history of the word. Again, interesting and informational. Good job, teacher. Let's keep going. Number 20. A third grade student who is an advanced learner has already demonstrated mastery of the derivational suffixes ness and mint which will be the focus of an upcoming whole class decoding and spelling lesson. Which of the following strategies for differentiating instruction for this lesson would be most appropriate for this student? First, having the student work on inflectional suffixes. Second, teaching the student the content plan for the following lesson. Third, encouraging the student to engage in independent silent reading. Or fourth, introducing the student to higher level derivational suffixes. So this is a common problem, not this exact one, but this problem of a, an advanced learner already having mastered skills that are going to be taught soon in the classroom. Question really is, what do you do? And for an advanced learner, what you don't do is just tell them to go off in a corner and read silently because you don't know really what they're doing. You know, they might just be thinking. You have to plan an exercise that's related to the one that the other students are doing, but you want to extend the assignment, you want to stretch the student's skills, you want to build off the student's existing understanding of the material. And in that case, this last option is the best option, introducing students to higher level um, derivational suffixes. Number 21, which of the following word pairs are homophones? Remember homophone, uh, homo means one, and phone is sound, so it's not going to be answer, reply, not playful, and replay, not table, and stable. That's rhyming. Sight and sight, right? So there are two words that sound the same with a different meaning. Number 22. A second grade teacher would like to include independent silent reading as one of several approaches used to promote students' fluency development when planning differentiated fluency instruction for individual students in the class the teacher should keep in mind that using independent silent reading to promote fluency does what? Let's have a look. First, is most critical for students whose sight word knowledge is below grade level. Second, should be limited to narrative texts in the early elementary grades. Third, is most effective when students select texts at or above their instructional reading level. I can tell you that one is off right now because it's not instructional reading level, it is independent reading level. All right, and let's go to the last one. Should be limited to students who have already acquired automaticity. That is right. Students reading with automaticity will best benefit from independent silent reading in order to further develop their reading fluency. It is the last option. 23. A fourth grade student who reads grade level narrative text with fluency and excellent comprehension is struggling to read aloud a grade level content area passage about a topic with which the student is familiar. 
The student reads the passage hesitantly, frequently stopping to reread clauses or entire sentences. Afterward, the student demonstrates limited comprehension of what was read. Interesting. Which of the following factors is most likely disrupting the student's fluent reading of this text? So there's a lot of information that we can pick apart just from this problem. Oftentimes, the student reads with excellent fluency and comprehension, but not this time, so why? Let's have a look at the options. First, insufficient background knowledge to support basic comprehension of the text. I know already that that is not the option that I'm going to choose because the problem says that this is a grade level content area um, with which the student is familiar with the topic, so it's not the first option. Next, lack of experience with academic language structures used in the text. That could definitely be it. Let's keep going. Insufficient monitoring of comprehension while reading the text. Again, it says at the beginning sentence that the student normally reads with excellent comprehension, so that's not it. And then lastly, lack of grade level word analysis skills for accurate decoding of the words in the text. Again, I know the last option is not the best option. However, it is the second option. There we go. Number 24. Which of the following instructional activities would best help upper elementary English learners develop intonations and rhymes of the English language to support reading fluency? Is it leading a class discussion on an age-appropriate topic, then having each student read aloud a section of a text that is written about the same topic? That, to me, doesn't seem to relate to intonation and rhyming, but okay, let's keep going. Having the students record their own oral reading of a passage and then listen to the recording while silently rereading the passage. That might help if the students read the correct type of passage, but let's see what number three says. Giving an expressive oral reading of a short text then having the student echo read the text as the teacher reads it allowed again. I can already pretty much guarantee you that this third option is going to be it because I know for English learners in particular, if you want to improve their reading fluency, use the instructional strategy of echo reading. And everyone, this whole matching of instructional strategy to reading need is completely given to you, and I've been saying this in almost every video, but completely given to you in both our study guide as well as taught in our course. If you're struggling matching the correct instructional strategy to all of the very many reading needs that are presented in the RECA content specifications, go ahead, get the bundle package at recatest.com, which includes not only our complete online course, but also our complete study guide for subtests one, two, and three. All right, so I'm going to go with this echo reading solution. Number 25, we're almost there, folks. You're doing great. A second grade teacher would like to plan an activity to improve the reading rate of two students who read at about the same rate and level and are both automatic readers. Which of the following activities would best address the student's needs? Is it? Number one, a cooperative silent reading activity in which the students read the same passage together silently, stopping periodically to share their understanding of the text. Because both of these students are automatic readers reading at a similar level, this could be a really good strategy, but let's go see what the other options say. A repeated reading activity in which each student takes several turns reading aloud a decodable passage to the other student while the other student follows along silently. Although that might be really beneficial for an English learner to hear the correct pronunciation, that's not the problem that we're working with here. So, so far, I like our first option best. Let's go have a look at the third one. A paired reading activity in which the students sit side by side and read a shared text aloud in unison, gradually increasing their pace as they proceed through the text. I know that that's not going to be it because if you tell students to gradually increase their pace, they're going to start reading like this and then they're going to go faster and faster. And reading as fast as you can isn't the purpose even when we're talking about rate. Remember that reading rate isn't about fast speed, it's about correct speed. But let's go have a look at our fourth option. A timed partner reading activity in which the students take turns silently reading a shared text for one minute while the other student keeps time and then says when to stop. So that means that you have one student reading and then you have one other student not reading, just looking at a timer. And that's not really what you want either. Although in order to assess rate, you can use a timed reading, it's not the instructional strategy to use. So I'm going back up to the very first, cooperative silent reading activity. This one's the best. 
Number 26, a second grader has demonstrated the ability to decode individual words accurately, but she reads very slowly and laboriously. When the teacher tries to engage the student in reading, when the teacher tries to engage the student in oral reading activity, she says she feels embarrassed and would rather read silently. Which of the following modifications to instruction would be most appropriate and effective for helping the student improve her reading fluency? Encouraging her to serve as an audience, I doubt that's going to be the best answer. Again, the student needs to read herself in order to build her own reading fluency. Next, having her reread a text several times using whisper reading to build her fluency and confidence with respect to the text. I can already tell you that that is the correct answer because, again, I know that the instructional strategy to build fluency is to use whisper reading. But we should make sure, so let's check the last two solutions teaching her how to use self-monitoring as she reads to improve her literal comprehension and ability. Okay, remember this is about fluency, not comprehension, so not the third one. Providing her with explicit phonics instruction to improve her word identification skills before requiring her to read aloud. It seems like she reads aloud pretty well, she's just a little embarrassed. And so what the teacher needs to do is use whisper reading. And I think it's a really cool solution to use to have her to provide her with the chance to read the text several times to gain confidence. That's pretty cool. Let's go on to number 27, and for this, we have a little diagram to check out. I can zoom in so we can see this a little bit better. Number 27, based on the student's reading performance on this assessment, instruction to increase the student's reading fluency should focus primarily on, okay, so let's have a look at what we even have here. Use the information below to answer the next two questions. In an oral fluency assessment at the beginning of the school year, a third grade student reads aloud an unfamiliar passage selected by the teacher. While the teacher records the student's reading performance on a separate copy of the text, noting the student's reading time and then calculating the student's oral reading fluency score the student excuse me the teacher's annotated copy of the passage appears below okay so now that i'm having a look at the teacher's notes let's go back and check out what the question wants us to do again based on the student's reading performance on this assessment instruction to increase the student's reading fluency should focus primarily okay so improve reading fluency In order to do that, is it, first one, enhancing the student's contextual analysis skills? Second, promoting the student's automatic word recognition. Anytime that I see automatic word recognition, or like something to do with automaticity, I'm really drawn to that, I've got to say. So third, improving the student's academic language skills. Is there any academic language in here even? I don't think so. This is a story that we're not, this isn't history, this isn't science. All right. Improving the students, okay, I can know. Expanding the students' oral vocabulary knowledge. That's not going to help with reading performance to build reading fluency. I'm going with B, promoting the students' automatic word recognition. Number 28, looks like we are using the same document. When reading the last sentence of the passage, the student pronounces the word imagine as imagine with the syllable may emphasized. Evidence from this assessment best supports which of the following interpretations of this word reading error. So what does that mean when a student might mispronounce a word like that? The student recognizes the base word, but is unaware of phonological shifts that apply to the derived form. I don't think the student recognized the base word. Otherwise, the student would have said, oh, that's image. So, you know, image in but the student didn't say image in the student said imagine all right the student is unfamiliar with syllabication rules governing medial consonants is the middle sound yes it is okay i like that second one so far the student does not apply the appropriate phonics generalizations to the last two syllables it wasn't only to the last two syllables the student applies syllabication and phonics rules correctly, but does not recognize the word. I agree. The student didn't really seem to recognize the word, and that's the one I'm going with because they just didn't recognize that imagine comes from image, and she couldn't image, and then she would have said, like, oh, it's imagine, leaving all the this behind. All right, everyone, that's it. Remember, when you're finished, click the submit button, and... 
I guess now that I did this off the cusp, let's check out what the score is. And you can do that by clicking the button view score. And holy moly, we did it folks. 28 out of 28. Everyone, we also have Rika practice subtest two and three. If you haven't already, go ahead, check those out. And um, go back to our Rika home, which is rikatest.com. Check out our study guides our online courses, and our bundle, which includes both of them. They are the best ways to learn the material for the RECA test and assess your understanding for the RECA test and just prepare you for the RECA test all together. Everyone, thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you on the next